Emerald Rapids is launching today. Intel's five nodes in four years, and uh, it's really interesting. And actually, I guarantee you this review is going to be different than any other review first look at Emerald Rapids that you're going to see, because I have different CPUs. This is the dual 32 core in our Supermicro platform. Dual 32 core? Listen, that voltage frequency curve has got to have an optimal point somewhere. And let's face it, you're not going to buy the 64 core or even higher core counts, and you're probably waiting on Sierra Forest or one of the other high core counts, you know, five nodes in four years. This is a refresh improvement over Sapphire Rapids. Sapphire Rapids just launched 11 months ago. That Intel is able to move this far in 11 months with Emerald Rapids really tells you something about the state of the server world, the competition, and uh, how good that is for everybody if you can see this kind of gains gen on gen. And this is just the first node in five nodes in four years. So let's take a closer look. Alright, this is our Supermicro Super Server SYS-621CTN12R. It's a 2U, but don't let the front 3.5 inch base fool you. That's Gen 5, PCIe Gen 5 and all of those. You want to run SATA, you want to run PCIe Gen 5 NVMe, like our Keoxia CM7s, you can do that. This is a perfect chassis for mixing different kinds of storage, depending on caching tiers and everything else. You can even run serial attached SCSI. If you prefer the old school hardware RAID cards, you're gonna run some SAS flash. You can do that in this chassis. It's a pretty standard 25.5 uh, inch or 648 millimeter depth, standard 19 inch rack. This is a dual socket E, that's LGA 4677 for fourth and fifth gen Xeon scalable processors. If you already have one of these, you can definitely upgrade to CPUs. It's designed to support up to 350 watt TDP CPUs, and it is 2U of air cooling. You can configure this with two double width or six single width GPUs. It is a fully qualified solution for the Intel GPU Flex 140s. You can also run NVIDIA H100, RTX A6000, L40, L40S. There's a complete list on Supermicro's website if you want to check that out. Now this is Intel's full price table that they sent over to go with the Emerald Rapids launch. And the CPUs that I have are squarely at the bottom of the first group, which means that they're a top tier CPU but even though they're only 32 cores, they're still some of the highest turboing CPUs that you get this generation. Also notice the memory speed, DDR5 5600 officially supported. That's pretty huge for DDR5 memory compatibility and memory speeds. We can also see that Intel's offering three SKUs in the single socket configuration for, you know, it's, these are not workstation parts, this is still meant for server workloads. Also notice the liquid cooled CPUs, which are up to 385 watts TDP. Those don't leave any performance on the table. If you want to talk PCIe slots, it's got four PCIe 5.0 by eight full height half length. They got two PCIe 5.0 by 16 full height full length, but it's fully configurable. We've got this new connector style, mini cool IO, and you can run NVMe, you can run PCIe, you can run all sorts of things like that off that. And so this chassis comes with the MCIO connectors and you use MCIO connectors and cables to decide how you want to cable your PCIe lanes. If you've got a lot of peripherals that just need eight lanes of Gen 5, you can do that. If you've got a lot of peripherals that need 16 lanes of Gen 5, you can do that. You just re-cable, you route the lanes yourself depending on where you want to go. Way cheaper than redrivers, switches, it's a much more practical, pragmatic approach. Kind of like the CPU platform. Dual 32 cores, this is the sweet spot for performance, memory bandwidth, because you still get eight channels per socket, NVMe, PCIe 5 connectivity, and all the PCIe 5 lanes for our 12 bays at the front, plus all the connectivity and PCIe slots, plus dual OCP 3.0 slots. The OCP 3.0 slots do support high power draw, high TDP cards, but you may have thermal concerns depending on the particular add-in card. So if you are DIYing something here with this chassis, be aware that you may have to do something supplemental for cooling if you're gonna rock a 400 gig ethernet card or use one of the OCP cards that have active cooling. On board, we also have two Gen 5 M.2 2280, so up to 80 millimeters in length. And you've also got a little bit of room over here near the power supplies. If you did want to sneak in a couple more U.2 or U.3 drives with breakout cables, there are accessories from Supermicro that let you do that. The other reason for this type of MCIO uh, routing requirement is if you are rocking some really high-end networking cards that are PCIe, even FPGAs, 16 lanes is not 16 lanes as it was in the past. 
you can route eight lanes to one CPU socket and another eight lanes to the other CPU socket. That reduces internal overhead and internal bus contention and uh, internal contention in the links between CPUs. So for some networking peripherals and some FPGAs and other accelerators, it can actually make sense to use the uh, connections here to create a 16 lane PCIe slot where the front half of the, the slot is routed to uh, socket zero and the other half of the slot, the back half, the back eight lanes are routed to, to the other CPU socket. When we're talking about Gen 5 and that level of speed, that actually can end up being much more efficient than routing those Gen 5 packets from one socket to the other. Certainly it's going to reduce the latency. And when we're talking about these kinds of speeds, reducing the latency effectively improves the throughput because you've reduced the round trip time, time you need for acknowledgements, etc., etc. So it is actually a surprisingly valid use case in cloud computing workloads. Our system as configured here and what we were using for all of our benchmarks and everything else, one terabyte of memory in this platform, 512 gigabytes per socket, that's 64 gigs per DIMM. One thing that is absolutely fabulous about our three and a half inch drive trays is that they're toolless for three and a half inch drives. Uh, they can't be toolless for two and a half inch drives, but you can mix three and a half inch and two and a half inch storage in this platform, which is a nice touch. This chassis is available in other configurations. You can get, you know, uh, super micro chassis that have, uh, you know, tons of two and a half inch drives at the front, but I think this is a good mix of PCIe IO, plus still giving you the option for Gen 5 at the front. And let's face it, everybody is waiting for Intel to really just bring the awesome performance at shockingly good power levels. And spoiler alert for our, uh, our benchmarks that we've done so far, you can actually see at the wall, like 35 upwards of 40% power efficiency improvements over Sapphire Rapids. When our Sapphire Rapids CPUs were running lightly threaded workloads, you'd hardly know it from looking at the power consumption. Well, that's not really the case anymore with the new Emerald Rapids platform. When it's a lightly threaded workload, you are running with significantly reduced power consumption, which is very nice to see. It's clear that from uh, some of the architecture diagrams and everything that Intel has provided in the transition from Sapphire Rapids to Emerald Rapids, they've made a lot of changes in silicon. These are 32 core parts. Uh, some of the higher core count parts are physically reducing the amount of silicon that they have, you know, because we were doing four tiles and that's not really a thing anymore with, with Emerald Rapids, at least for these core counts. They are supporting higher core count parts, but remember, five nodes in four years means that they are coming with Sierra Forest, which is gonna be an ungodly number of cores. At Intel Innovation, they were showing it off during the presentation and those are efficiency cores, but they have packed so many efficiency cores, like for certain kinds of cloud workloads, that makes sense. This is a workhorse platform. 32 cores, you know, we're talking 60 megs of L3 cache per socket, which is another major improvement for this CPU generation. And it really does translate having extra L3 cache in our actual performance numbers. For most of our benchmarks, we were using the Pharonix test suite on Linux to run through a whole bunch of different options. But we also use real world workload simulation uh, software like Comsol to see how the performance stacked up, not just gen on gen from Sapphire Rapids to Emerald Rapids, but how it stacks up in the large larger world of, uh, of a competition, competitive server landscape. Well, the Emerald Rapid system is running before me, and uh, is it Emerald City at the end of the yellow brick road for Intel, or is it something else? But the results actually are pretty shocking. We have never seen this much improvement from Intel this rapidly, generation on generation. Remember, Sapphire Rapids just launched 11 months ago, and these are server parts, and uh, the performance uplift here is actually pretty dramatic. Intel's claim, up to 40% in a lot of workloads, but in some of these results, that's actually a pretty conservative estimate. Some of these workloads go well beyond 40%. And yet, is it enough? Is it enough in the competitive landscape? Well, keep in mind that these server CPUs are 350 watts, and that's a thing, and that's you know fun and exciting and everything goes with that. But when you dig under the hood, you dig under the covers a little bit, you'll find that there are some Emerald Rapid CPUs that can use up to 385 watts, depending on system configuration and some other options, even not counting the more exotic uh, liquid-cooled variety, 385 watts. The systems that I'm looking at, again, 32 core, these are not top of stack CPUs. And so because they're not top of stack CPUs, you need to take that into account when you're looking at the benchmarks two 32-core CPUs with eight memory channels. 
The memory channel and memory bandwidth improvements is one of the first places that Intel has really dramatically improved over Sapphire Rapids. Our A to 64 scores, we look at this, 80 nanoseconds of DDR5 system memory latency as measured by A to 64. Now, A to 64 itself, you gotta take it with a grain of salt, but this benchmark is showing a 20% improvement. And that's silicon improvements, that's probably prefetch improvements, that's probably other improvements that are made in the DDR5 pipeline. And with eight memory channels versus other platforms that have 12 memory channels, you're gonna need to squeeze every little bit of bandwidth out of this platform that you can. And boy, Intel is doing that here. We'll come back to Windows in a second. I just wanted to sort of get that out of the way because I always like to get the baseline, you know, single thread boost performance, give it the best possible opportunity. And for the Intel platform, it sort of seems like Microsoft and Intel work pretty closely together to get the boost behavior worked out in the memory bandwidth and that sort of thing. There was a lot of customers running SQL Server and other things like that that are Windows platform specific and it's always nice to just make sure everything is running properly. On the Linux side of the world, things are a little bit more interesting. Now, of course, benchmarks that can leverage Intel's accelerators, especially AMX or AI accelerators, like what you get from running OpenVINO or even one API type benchmarks. Yes, the performance delta here on this platform is just as pronounced as Sapphire Rapids, even more so because you get that generational improvement. A generational improvement is just 11 months. I mean, this is, aren't these things that normally have like an 18 to 24 month cadence with Intel? I mean, so anything that is able to take advantage of Intel specific hardware or Intel specific hardware accelerators is going to have far and away a per core advantage and even a per watt advantage. But everything else, the breakdown gets a little murkier. If you look at uh, web type benchmarks, like this is going to be a web server, we're benchmarking Nginx, we're benchmarking Apache, we're benchmarking PHP, we're benchmarking Python then yes, again, you get those generational improvements. But in the larger competitive landscape, Intel has a tough time pulling ahead, either in terms of per watt efficiency or peak per core efficiency. So all right, we'll have a little bit of fun on Windows. <laughs> Can the server game? Okay, this is a dumb, like this is not a benchmark or anything you should take seriously, but it is kind of fun because let's, you want to run CSGO. And it's like, okay, on this server CPU, you're running CSGO, again, keeping in mind that you have 64 cores, 128 threads, Yes, the CSGO performance well over 100 FPS. Why is that useful or something interesting? Even though this is 64 cores and even though we're fitting in 350 watts per CPU in our power envelope, because these CPUs are about 350 watts, then we're still able to turbo. We're still able to turbo pretty significantly. And that bears out in Geekbench as well. When you look at Geekbench multi-core versus a single core, you see those really high clocks. And this is something that Intel also had on Sapphire Rapids, but they didn't have the power efficiency there. Similarly, if we look at the performance for something like Cinebench, which scales really well, it's not really a useful real world performance benchmark, but just to give you some numbers and a baseline and how all this fits together, all right, that's pretty good. Now, let's talk for a second about how benchmarks can be a little misleading. Specifically, when we're talking about the web server, you should check out the video that I did on Intel's accelerators and AMX. And if you take the job, the workload holistically, I'm going to run a web server and I'm gonna terminate TLS, that's encrypted web certificate or encrypted web connections on this and process all of that. And this is going to be you know, a glorified web front end server. Then Intel is answering that problem with core resources as well as accelerator resources. So you have a heterogeneous approach to the compute problems in the whole, I need to serve anonymous traffic on the internet, I need to stand up connections and tear them down really quickly. In the ecosystem, in a data center, a lot of the time you would have an appliance that's handling the encryption because you can do that really, really quickly in application specific hardware. And then from that appliance to your servers is unencrypted information. In fact, some systems now will do that at the PCIe level, like your network card is the thing that's doing the encryption and decryption. So everything travels over the bus from the network card to the CPU or system memory in an unencrypted format. Whereas if your network card doesn't do that, then it's up to the CPU to do the decryption as well as everything else. Enter Intel's accelerators. By doing that, you can get away with a dumb, cheap network card as opposed to an expensive network card that has a whole bunch of stuff that it does. And so Intel is sort of approaching that problem holistically and saying, if you're gonna do that, then you should do this. 
And so if we redo our Linux benchmarks and we say that we're gonna run PHP and Nginx and do our TLS encryption uh, connection setup and teardown as part of that, then this system will handily outperform other systems that you can get on the market because it's sort of real world and it's holistic. It's not just doing one thing. When we look at our Pharonix benchmarks and we do PHP bench, that's this server only doing PHP. When we do an Nginx benchmark, that's this server only doing Nginx. Real world, it's gonna be doing encryption, TLS. It's gonna be doing PHP. It's gonna be doing Nginx, at least for that one specific application. And you might have a whole pool of these servers. Or maybe not, maybe it's not doing TLS. Maybe you have an, an F5 appliance that's doing that. And you gotta take that into account. You as a system administrator putting this together have to sort of know what you're looking for in your benchmarks and your performance and everything else. But as far as they've come, Intel had better not slow down. Five nodes in four years, that's what they're gonna have to pull off to maintain customer confidence. And this is the opening salvo with Emerald Rapids, an improvement over Sapphire Rapids to be sure. Will it be enough? Well, we're going to see what the market says, aren't we? I'm Bundle, this is Level 1. I'm signing out. This is the Emerald Rapids launch. You can find me in the Level 1 forums. Hopefully, I get my hands on some higher-end SKUs because Intel does have some interesting work use case propositions as far as workloads and accelerators go. But for now, 64 cores and two sockets and a terabyte of memory, that's what I've got to play with. So if you've got a workload that you want to run or something that you want to do, let me know. We'll take it for a spin. You can find me in the Level 1 forums. All right, I'm signing out, and I'll see you there.